introductions in the room, but we're, we're going to um, wait and do that at the last part of our, our announcement part of the meeting. I'm Terry Schaefer, and I'm the government chair for the Evolving the Workforce Community of Interest, and welcome everyone today. We have um, great registration for this meeting. I think a lot of people are online. We had over 60 people who were registered, so um, we appreciate everyone's participation and those who made it in here today. We have a few announcements to make. Um, actually, is uh, can, can Dave speak yet? <laughs> Dave Potts, who's our, our industry vice chair, is on the phone, and he's going to provide us with an update on a project we have for our, for our COI. We'll see when Dave can be heard. <laughs> Do you need a couple minutes, Nancy? All right. Do you think? Oh. All right, I think we were just unmuted. Hey, there everyone. we go. Uh, this is Dave Potts. Terry, can you guys hear me okay? We can. I'm going to turn up the volume just a little. Go ahead. Perfect. Well, thanks for the opportunity. Sorry I couldn't be there in person with you all today, but definitely excited about uh, this particular topic. Um, we do have an uh, ongoing project uh, that we've had uh, continuing from 2017 and, and continuing to 2018 as well. Uh, it's called Talent as a Service, also referred to as TAAS. So if you see that uh, abbreviation, uh, you'll know what it stands for. So um, been a, a significant amount of work um, going into this year. Um, if, if you have not had a chance to uh, read through um, the white paper um, that we put out towards the end uh, of, uh, of October, um, it is on the ACT I Act uh, site. And um, it, is, it is called uh, Talent as a Service, Reimagining How the Federal Government Sources, Recruits, and Onboards Talent. So, um, so we have had over the past month uh, some additional kickoff sessions for our Phase 2 uh, piece of the project. Um, we also had a call for volunteers um, and very happy to report that we've had about six or seven uh, folks who have joined the group. So now we're up to a very robust uh, 15 individuals, which is a great Great, um, great number for us in terms of uh, being able to uh, collaborate and pull in uh, relative um, experiences and expertise across government uh, and industry as well. Uh, just in terms of some of the uh, upcoming things that we've got, on January 12th, uh, 12 o'clock, we'll have our first virtual um, collaboration meeting uh, with the team. And then on January 26th from uh, 12 to 2 will be our first uh, in-person uh, collaboration meeting uh, with the team as well. Um, the plan uh, is to push through uh, the June and July time frame of this year and to come up with a concept of operations for how many of these um, many of these areas are, are, are hopefully going to be able to uh, work and be promoted throughout government. So um, really excited about the progress we've made so far, but definitely uh, more excited about the possibilities here as well. So uh, happy to answer any questions that you guys have towards the end or the Q&A period. Um, and uh, I think, Terry, that's probably good, and hand it back over to you. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Nancy, did you want to um, give a little update here for the Igniting Innovation? We're out for nominations, and that Absolutely. closes at the so end of the month. Kayak has this exciting program. It's called Igniting Innovation, and right now we are accepting nominations. So if you know of any government program that is improving services to government or citizen experience, please nominate them. Um, the deadline is December 31st, and I'll be happy to send the link about the program for more information and the nomination form. So, so yes. Sorry, Nancy, quick question. I was trying to nominate somebody, and mm -hmm. I got the impression from the questions that it was almost like a self-nomination. You're saying that we can nominate on behalf of any program? Right, you okay. could. It could be a self-nomination, but you can also nominate another program. Oh, great. Right, Deb? That is great. Okay. That's great, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. So we look forward to your nominations. Thank you. I think we'll go ahead and make introductions around the room, and then I'm going to hand it off to Doris Reeves, who's our program chair, to talk about our next program and introduce our speaker today. So you want to go ahead? Doris Reeves, DAI Solutions. Um, as uh, Terry said, program chair, and uh, I'm new in this position and having a lot of fun coming up with 2018 uh, topics and uh, guest speakers. So. I look forward to presenting all that to you. I'm Jenny O with Monster Government Solutions. Um, I work as a strategic account manager for the Department of Veterans Affairs. 
Hi, I'm Adam D'Angelo with Dev Technology Group. I'm currently supporting Immigration and Customs Enforcement as they're modernizing their uh, human capital systems, getting off the mainframe and moving towards a more modern web platform and uh, streamlining their business process. Hello, Brent Williams uh, with Macro Solutions, uh, in development and uh, capture management for, for Macro, and specialize in enterprise application development and integration system engineering. I'm Deborah Tomchek. I'm the uh, Vice President at ICF, and I am also the industry chair for this um, community of interest. Um, my focus is entirely in human capital. Andy Lieber with TBD Consulting. Uh, I help uh, businesses increase their revenue within the government marketplace. Christina Frias Brown, I'm with the Department of Treasury uh, in the area of human capital. I'm uh, personally um, an employment agent and workforce um, performance management, but we also have our MBA account management solutions and how we can integrate human capital, the various human capital uh, programs. Hi, Bob Clark. Can't hear anything. Uh, we're going around the room and making introductions, so it's a little difficult with our uh, phone being kind of far from yeah. it. <laughs> Sorry. Bob Clark okay, thank with, you. with Clark Sales Consulting, and I'm the communications chair for the COI. I'm Nancy Delano, JIX staff. I'm Joe Barlow. So I'm in learning and development at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Hi, folks. Juan Salazar. I'm industry with Mark Logic. I cater to our federal civilian clients, and uh, I'm also the Nexus liaison to the CWFCOI. Kay Amatori. Uh, we're with Jefferson Solutions. It's a small woman-owned business, uh, currently supporting NIH's Office of Acquisition and Logistics Management, um, putting together a professional development program for them, and then with Forest Service, um, currently designing management program for their uh, policy branch. They just got stood up. Uh, Maria Biancali, also with Jefferson. All right, thank you everyone. Um, Bob, you have a, an announcement as well? Yes, just two quick things. Uh, first, I want to give a shout out, um, since those of you on the line are not uh, are muted, I want to give a shout out for some of the agencies who are on the phone today. Um, Defense Health Agency, Environmental Protection Agency, the FAA, uh, several folks from the GSA, uh, Library of Congress, uh, NASA, National Park Service, OPM, Secret Service, SEC, AID, Department of Agriculture, Department of Commerce, Department of Energy, Department of Justice, Department of Treasury, and Department of Transportation and the Merit Systems Protection Board. So uh, welcome to all of you on the line. The other thing is uh, one of the benefits of attending in person is some of us are going to lunch after this meeting. Uh, so any of you who would be interested in lunch, we're going across the street to the bottom line right after this. Uh, it is Dutch treat. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all right, thanks, Bob. Doris, do you want to? And I think we do have folks on the phone muted now, so when we get to the Q&A, we'll unmute and I uh, can ask questions. Yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to introduce our speaker here in a minute, um, which I know everybody is just waiting to um, hear the content of this um, very in-depth, and uh, we're all looking forward to that. Um, for our January 11th meeting, um, we are looking at the changing environment and the uncertainty um, that's in the human capital arena now, um, <coughs> strategies for success in handling all the changes within. Um, and we're going to be at the GSA building in January, on January 11th, so when you get your invitation, you'll see that posted, um, so look out for that. Uh, for February, we're looking at the new regulations for NICE, which is the um, national um, initiative for cybersecurity education and all the changes that are taking place there with uh, Trey Kennedy. So we're building our 2018 uh, program to deliver what is current and relevant to everybody um, in the industry for human capital. Now it's my pleasure. Uh, to introduce uh, Michael Torres from um, OPM, 
the program manager for human capital transformation. Um, and he has over 20 years experience in this, so um, a lot of depth in here, experience in organizational development, um, program management, and education. And you're gonna see the slides here. The people on the phone have access to the uh, documents on the website, and there were copies in the back. So this is gonna be an interesting session, so I'm not gonna take much of your time. I'll let you explain it as you go through. So, Michael, welcome. I'll get that fixed. Is that us? No, that's us. Wait. She's muting. Nancy? Well, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Michael Torres. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about the um, a different lens in which you can view HR. Um, as you may or may not know, OPM um, has had this thing called the, human, uh, the, the business reference model for HR for the last 13 years. It's a 13-year-old model. However, the last time it was touched was back in 2006. Um, so today what we're going to talk about is two things. We're going to talk about what the new model looks like, how we got to the new model, and then we're going to talk about how we're going to evolve that model and use it to, um, to further transform HR as we know it today. So the first thing I'd like to focus on is the word human capital. One of the questions I often get and I often ask is, what is the difference between human capital and HR? human resources. Um, and that can be looked at from a single perspective, the singular. It is HR is typically focused on the individual, the employee, and what we realize in our mantra, hire to retire, um, the employee is the most important asset in HR. However, to run an effective HR program, there are a lot of other aspects of HR that are not employee facing. And there's a lot of research and a lot of uh, um, definitions for both HR and human capital, but in, mo in its most simplistic sense, human capital is the entire end-to-end -end programmatic view to manage and maintain all the human resources within someone's organization. So both the people-centric perspective, the individual, the most important asset, and then all the programmatic aspects of running an HR operations. So OPM has decided to evolve the perspective of the mission from just individual to everything, human capital management. And that's why we are now using the word human capital versus human resources. Um, as we're going through this process, I would encourage you to engage me in dialogue wherever you find interest comments or even concerns for that matter because I, I, I find that that helps the conversation move along more, more fluently. Um, working the slide here. There we go. So first things first, what is the human capital business reference model? The official definition is it's the end-to-end -end operational life cycle for, human, for federal human capital management. However, I always like to define things with examples. Um, if the president enacted a brand new agency today and he appointed me as the secretary or the director or the administrator of that agency, at some point, a natural question would evolve in my mind. What do I need to do to deliver HR effectively within my organization? And the answer to that question is the HCBRM, the Human Capital Business Reference Model. The reason being is the human capital business reference model is designed to represent every aspect, every functional aspect from beginning to end. Both government-wide responsibilities that OPM is supposed to be bringing to the table and agency responsibilities that both agency and their partners are providing their employees, their managers, and their practitioners. Um, within the attachments that were sent out, and for those of you in the room, um, there was one handout that is simply titled HCBRM Map. If you walk away with anything else, and uh, if you don't walk away with anything else, walk away with that one page. Print it out, put it on your table, um, on your door, hand it out to people, 
because that summarizes everything we're going to talk about today. Um, it looks like this pretty picture right here, literally a one-pager. I'm a fan of one-pagers. Um, Not too many. There we go. Excellent. So the HCBRM, um, as described in the map, is broken up into four categorical functions or functional types, um, totaling 15 level one functions and 54 level two functions, or what we call subfunctions. Um, the four categorical functional types are simply put as government-wide, enabling, employee life cycle, and supporting. But before I explain those, one of the things that we're probably all familiar with is OPM's mantra, the federal HR mantra, and more importantly, the industry's mantra, hire to retire. Right? Everyone is all about hire to retire. However, what if I told you that hire to retire for operational HR was only half of the responsibility? And what if I told you that hire to retire is only one third of the federal responsibility to delivering human capital? And that's the, prim um, the primary issue that we've always been facing where part of HR historically was very formalized. And understood, and that every other part of HR was just assumed and informally practiced. It was like, well, I expect that we all breathe, so why do I have to say breathe to keep you alive? Same concept. However, the problem is, is when the rubber hits the road, the Chicos, the Chief Human Capital Officers, often face a dilemma. Everyone telling them, you need to know your workforce. You need to know your culture. You need to understand the dynamics that are needed to run your, your, your HR organizations, but then they don't fund them. They don't know how to buy it effectively. And that's what we're trying to solve with the BRM. Government-wide functions is one of my favorite areas of the BRM. Why? Well, OPM has historically been very good at telling you what you need to do, but historically been um, not as good at helping everyone understand in clear transparency what their role is in federal human capital management. What the government-wide functions is, is a complete deconstruction of what OPM's role is across federal human capital management. So it answers one simple question. What is OPM supposed to do for me? Enabling functions, employee life cycle functions, and supporting functions um, are all the functional areas that an agency and their partners are responsible for delivering both their employees, their managers, and their practitioners. Remember, historically, when we talk about human resources, we talk about the singular effect, the employee. But in order to run an effective HR organization, we have to consider the three core stakeholders which is, is more than just the employee. The enabling functions, as you see in this map, A1, A10, are all of the non-employee facing programmatic aspects of running an HR organization. Policy, strategy, operating plans, workforce planning, and more importantly, programmatic evaluation. One of the biggest issues that OPM had is when they went in and they evaluated agencies' um, operational health for HR, they do that 20, 30, 40 million dollars in only to identify there needs to be a course correction. Three year cycles, two year cycle evaluations. Why wait till all that money is invested to discover a problem? So now what OPM is saying is that agencies have the responsibility to do internal programmatic evaluation to the same level of standard that OPM will do when they come in the door. Meaning that agencies should know what their program health is before OPM tells them. And that's one of the major differences um, from a programmatic perspective between this model and all of its predecessors. 
The employee life cycle functions is your hire to retire. If you're looking at the map, it's everything in the red box. And I always like highlighting that because there's so much outside of the red box that we have to care about that we never effectively budgeted or formally planned for. We just knew we had to do. And then, of course, your supporting functions. The supporting functions are basically the tertiary functions that we kind of always have to do, but never really think to effectively plan and understand how it supports the life cycle functions. Uh, employee relations, labor relations, and my super new favorite category of functions, workforce analytics. Why? Industry already understands that workforce analytics is probably one of the most important core non-employee facing functions needed not only to understand but to evolve how we manage and develop our workforce. But the government doesn't know how to deal with that because it is, again it is a social practice. It is a soft practice and more importantly because of that how do Chico's justify funding and how do Chico's effectively buy something that isn't a core part of the mission. So what we've done um, at OPM is we said we need to formalize workforce analytics as a core function. And I'll talk a little bit more about that particular category later on when we talk about how the BRM was constructed. Any questions so far? There we go. Oh, oh, I think I got it now. So, this particular topic is probably the most controversial. Why? Because scholarship would tell you that there are 15 plus definitions for that new buzzword that's been around for a few years. Talent management. If you ask 15 different people to define talent management, you'll get 15 def different definitions. So, put a dot on the board and to plant a flag, we basically said, right now, the federal government is defining talent management as employee life cycle functions. Arguably, there are outside functions that would fall into that, workforce analytics, as an example, Empl uh, workforce planning, as an example. We're not saying that that's not a core part of talent management, we're just saying that right now, we just needed to draw a box, and we are currently evaluating what other parts of the HCBRM will be rolled up underneath there. However, for now, talent management is a composite of talent acquisition, which is everything hiring and recruitment, talent development, which is learning and education, employee uh, performance management, compensation and benefits, and separation and retirement processes. I will highlight two things, actually three things. Um, not only federal HR, but HR in general across industry have three orphans. Payroll, time and attendance, onboarding. Why are they orphans? Well, does finance own them? Does the CIO own them? Does HR own them? I don't know. It seems like an IT system, but is it really IT? So I'm going to go into more detail in the next slide as to how we constructed it. But what we decided to do is we, we decided to ask for people's experiential knowledge. Why? Because if I ask every executive in OPM and every Chico, we will get a different opinion based on their 30 plus years of experience. So we basically said, if no one wants to hot potato, but everyone is so smart about it, why can't we find a home? So we stopped asking people and we went to the books. We basically cracked open the laws and the regulations and we say, is there a home for this stuff? And the answer to that is yes for some and no for others. It turns out that there is a home for payroll and it's in HR. More specifically, it's aligned to compensation management. It turns out that time and attendance is a nickname. It's an IT name. Like people call me Mike. My abuela calls me Miguelito, or used to at least, right? However, my legal name is Michael. 
Well, it turns out TMA has a legal name. Its legal name is Work Schedule and Leave Management. There's an entire body of law and regulation dedicated just for TMA. Who'd have thought? So, OPM now recognizes and the community now recognizes that both payroll and time and attendance are HR functions and they fall right there. The third um, orphan is onboarding. We basically always said, kind of like workforce analytics, onboarding is something that can be assumed. We just all do it. The problem is no one does it the same way. There's only one goal for onboarding. Are we effectively preparing new hires to deliver on their part of the mission? Are we effectively assimilating and integrating new hires into our cultural dynamic? And the answer to that is, unfortunately, it is clearly inconsistent. Ask your employees. There's 2.1 million opinions as to how well that's going. So what we basically said is that onboarding is now a core function. However, there is no specific body of law or regulation that addresses onboarding or new hire processing. However, because there is no one, there is all. Onboarding involves hiring and, 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 and recruitment processing. It involves training and development. It involves performance. It involves compensation. It involves pretty much everything that occurs within the first 12 months or so of the employee's experience within an agency. So those, those are the three core things I wanted to pick out. Um, that being said, another core function that is unique to the federal government or the partners that engage the federal government is application screening reciprocity and investigation requests, and more importantly, what we affectionately call as suitability and continuous vetting. Throughout this model, within the agency's area of responsibility, and within OPM's area of responsibility, you will see um, continuous vetting and suitability spread and sprinkled everywhere. So that's another area that's new. So in summary, all the new stuff, payroll, time and attendance has a home, onboarding is a thing, workforce analytics is now official, and continuous vetting and um, suitability it's now a core function of everyone. Any questions so far? And now we have, now we understand what talent management is. So a little bit of history. The first version of the BRM came out in 2004. The next version was 2006. However, if you ask 10 people if they know what the BRM is, eight of them will tell you no. That one person will tell you yeah, yeah, I kind of know what it is. And then that one person, that, that, that last person actually used it 10 years ago. The only problem is, is that why didn't it take traction? Why doesn't anyone know it? And it's very simple. OD would tell us, organizational development theory would tell us, cultural resistance. Why? Historically, we would always focus on one simple thing, telling you how to do it. And while in one company it is effective to streamline process, when you have a conglomerate of business units, using corporate term, um, called the federal government or the executive branch, standardizing process at the most granular level will always be seen and fought with resistance. So why not just let agencies worry about how and why don't we just get into the business of service delivery? And that's where we primarily changed the paradigm of how we went into 3.0. We didn't start from the old version. We basically said the old version was no longer effective because we don't care about process. I'm a technologist by trade. Although you heard my cool little intro about OD and education and all that other good stuff. I'm actually, by trade, an infrastructure architect. And I can tell you the, 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 an enabling factor of, of HR is IT, but it is not a driver. And if we look at this through the IT lens, we will fail. 
So we basically said, we're not going to look at this as a process. We're going to start over. We put up a big whiteboard on the board, and we said, let's start from scratch. And we said, we're going to only focus on a service-based approach. What are the core services we expect the government to deliver when we say the words human capital management? And what are the outputs of that? So as long, so as, long as every agency and provider and partner is delivering on an outcome that has a common level of satisfaction and quality, who cares about the how? And that is the fundamental difference between old models and the current model. Old models are process-based, new model is functional and service-based, and that's as granular as we go. We don't go any deeper than that. Any questions? Um, so there are a couple of ways that we're currently implementing it. Um, we are working with agencies um, to figure out how they're, in, um, on a case-by-case -case basis, we're helping them develop their approach to implementing the BRM and evaluating their programmatic health and their workforce. We are working with OMB um, to, um, to update all of the eCPIC codes um, and uh, funding codes to help inform the CBJ formulation, um, the investment formulation, as well as operational plan reporting. Um, we're working with FEA to um, incorporate and build the HR part of the TBM, uh, Technical Business Model, um, using the BRM as an underlying structure. And we are working with GSA to remap and recreate all the NASC and PSC codes that will be used in future acquisition, so that way we bring synergy to the trifecta. Why? Because if you compare formulated operating plans, agency operating plans, to the actual operating plans at the end of the year, there's not a direct map. If you, form, if, if you compare the operating plans of an agency to OMB investment reporting, there's not a direct map. If you compare OPM investment reporting to GSA um, 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 acquisition reporting, there's not a direct mapping. And then if you compare all three, it's not a direct mapping. Why is one $2 billion and one $1 billion? It's like, if you ask the HROB, which is who I work for, all I can tell you is that HRIT costs anywhere between $1.6 billion and $2.1 billion. That's a hell of a delta. Why? Primarily because of this discrepancy. And it's based on a simple issue of codification and definition. Now this brings me to explain what is the BRM, or more importantly, what is it designed to do? Well, it's designed to look pretty on paper. You can put it on your wall. If you fold it in half, and then one more time, it's a pretty cup holder. However, the reason why I give you that example is because the BRM, like PMI principles, like ITIL, is not a tool. It is a practice. So what is this practice designed to do? Three simple things. The BRM is designed to standardize vernacular and definition across the entire federal space. So when we say the word um, position classification, when we say the word training, we are all saying it the same exact way and defining it the same exact way. The second category is functional scope. We are categorically dividing HR into 54 boxes. Why is that important? Well, if you ask any Chico what's your priority, they say everything. But then you show them their budget, and they say, then they say, well, I can't do everything. I can only do some things. Well, pick a box. It's literally designed to be a fast food menu. I usually give you an analogy on who, but I'm not sure if I can now. So it's usually designed to be a fast food menu. This year's priorities, because of my budget, is one, two, four, and eight. And then the last and most important is a codification model. It is designed to be a taxonomy, to begin codifying and bringing together the synergy of data between the three legs I mentioned, 
operations, acquisition, spend. So the question I will leave with you now, and the last question I will ask you before we leave today is simple. How are, using, how are you using the BRM to streamline language, which is the most important aspect of culture, to understand the core business function, and to normalize data? Any questions? You want me to un have her unmute because you oh, yeah, have a lot of information. Yep. Um, Nancy? Nancy? Oh, is she unmuting? Only the host can talk now. Everyone can talk now. Okay. Does anyone on the phone have any questions? No questions on the phone. So this was basically, um, what is the impetus of all this? Well, what, what, what kind of drove this new evolution? You will now be placed into the conference. She's muting. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so the Chico's, the Chief Human, uh, uh, Officer, Chief, Chief Human Resources Officers Council, in 2014 defined four new goals for the federal government at large in regards to human capital management. Common user experience, data standardization and making data accessible, system integration, and, secure, and common security standards. However, I will highlight the very first one, common user experience. And more importantly, I will highlight one word, the word common. It's funny because you see a bunch of executives, very smart, educated, mostly doctors, right? They're all like PhD masters, right? Sitting in a room, philosophizing on the word common. Should we use the word common? Should we say same? Should we say identical? But what does the word mean to us? And when it came down to it, it was driven by one simple principle. We don't want everyone to do it the same way. We don't care. We just want employees to have a common experience. We want employees to experience the same level of quality and satisfaction. So agencies, providers, and vendors can deliver it at an operational level however they want as long as the output is the same and the satisfaction and quality is the same. And again, much more than our employees because <laughs> what are the three core stakeholders of human capital management, not just HR? The federal employee, which is number one, Managers, practitioners. Why are practitioners secondhand citizens in HR? Why can't they be number one with employees? And that's what we're driving. So the common user experience was what drove the, 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 the core principle of a, a service-centric approach, not a process-centric approach. So how did we construct the BRM? The BRM was evolved through a three-phase three process. I will wholly admit, me and my team, in a sandbox, got into a room, and we said, we don't want to ask anyone anyone. We don't want to ask anyone their opinion. We're just going to read every word of the CFR, and we're going to compartmentalize it into functional groups. And we did that. My heart hurts every time I have PTSD flashbacks of reading those volumes. However, based on our limited interpretations, because remember, we're not the experts. Based on our interpretation and categorization of the CFR, we ended up at 12 functions and 48 subfunctions. We did the bulk of the work. Then we, did, we went through a peer review process. And we, we basically said, we engaged 100 plus practitioners and industry experts, and we asked them validate our, our analysis. And they did that. And based on their, uh, of their feedback, we ended up at 13 core functions and 45 subfunctions. Then we went to, um, into phase three, which was the legal um, and OPM approval. And through the legal analysis and OPM approval, we finally got it right. 
we ended up at 15 core functions and 54 subfunctions. And the reality of that is that the main difference between this and that, uh, for the most part, um, continuous vetting, um, but also we deconstructed uh, when, we, when, when I finally convinced OPM that it's important for us to open up the books and really be transparent with what our responsibility is, they said, Mike, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it right. And that took the bulk of time trying to deconstruct the government-wide functions and understanding the relationship between OPM and customer agency. Uh, question in the back. This is actually a question from the phone. Um, you've identified government-wide uh, functions and agency functions. Does the VRM indicate which are business unit functions within the agency? That's my favorite question in the whole wide world, Bob. I've always wanted to say that. <laughs> uh, so the question is, which functions within the HCBRM is a business function? All of them. 100% of them. This is absolutely not reflective of IT. It is not reflective of, of um, process. It is not reflective of an agency's policy landscape. It is purely reflective on what the law requires us to deliver. So the answer to that question is all 54 functions are required by law some exceptions, and I'll explain where, um, for agencies and OPM to deliver. So everything between A1 and A10, agencies have to deliver all of those functions, so all core business functions. Yes? Let me go back and clarify, because I think you're asking slightly differently. So there's OPM level functions, there's agency level functions. I think you're asking, business units within agencies, is there any distinction that says this is these particular functions don't belong to the agency, they belong to business units within the agency? So remember, remember the, so the question is, do, uh, based on the hierarchy, OPM, department, business units, or, a, or components below that, I would say that A1 to A10 are the core functions every operational HR office has to deliver. So, if you are an operational HR office at the department level, if you are an operational HR office at the component level, you have to deliver A1 through A10. However, departments and, agent and components are self-governing. They will internalize how they effectively deliver or manage that. So, I'm not, I'm, I, would, I wouldn't say that there's a one-size-fits-all response to that, except that if you are the director of HR, you either have to deliver everything between A1 and A10, or you have to identify what parts of A1 and A10 are outsourced to other agencies, other departments, other vendors, other partners. Now, one of the things I will highlight here is that as part of our cursory, uh, uh, as part of our review in uh, phase one, we also compared the model that we, that uh, once we compartmentalized everything to industry stand best practices, um, and we, based on that, we identified a number of deltas um, that is gapped in policy and regulation. For example, um, if you look at the map on the workforce analytics. The last two functions, or sub-functions, which is employee records, uh, record keeping and employee records disclosure, is foundationally grounded in regulation and law. However, the other four are not. We recognize that those are policy gaps. We need to develop policy around them, but they are key core functions. Same thing with onboarding. No policy for onboarding. However, we recognize that it has to be a thing. And then a, a number of other things across this as well. So uh, I would say 95% of the entire BRM is founded in law and regulation, and the other 5% was an evolution of industry best practices that HR organizations should be doing within their operational shop. Any questions?
there you go. So this next slide um, maps, kind of shows you in comparison the federal human capital business reference model 3.0, how it compares to its predecessor 2.0, our current human capital framework, HCF. I will say that the HCF and VRM are synergistic. They work together. They look at different levels of, they work at different levels of analysis. The BRM is at a very 10,000 foot view, what is HR at a functional level? The, HC, the OPM HCF is how we operationally define and implement systems, not IT systems, but programmatic systems within those levels. So they, they, they complement each other. And then how they compare to industry. And there's one simple thing that we realized. There are some things that industry does that the government doesn't have to do, very few. And there are some things that the government has to do that the industry doesn't have to. I'm sorry, there are some things that the government has to do that the industry doesn't have to. And we're okay with that. Um, so that's what it should, that's kind of helping you understand how we compare it. There's one category here that we didn't throw on because um, we developed this a couple of months before we finalized the last version. And it's continuous vetting and suitability. Continuous vetting and suitability is a category that should be on here that is unique to the federal government unless you're partnering with the federal government. That is an HR function within the federal government. Now, this, the, uh, we enter the segment of the, of the presentation uh, that basically stops talking about what is and starts moving into how do we use operationally, like re in the real world. Um, so before we make that transition, does anyone have any questions? Is there a time check? How much time? You're good. Yeah. How much time? Um, 40 minutes. 40? Oh, wow. 40 minutes. It's like gold. Um, so, <clears throat> I explained why, or I explained um, what are the three things the BRM does, right? Um, the standardizing uh, uh, definition and terminology, functional categorization of scope, and codification. Right? And if you print it out, it can be a pretty couple. Right? However, how do Chico's use it? How do partners use it? And the reality is, how many of you, or um, I'm asking those of us in the room, how many of you, by a show of hands, have helped transform HR, but solely in the context of HR IT, because IT is obviously the problem? Right? No show of hands in the room, so that's okay. Usually I ask that question, three quarters of everyone says, IT, IT, we gotta transform IT. However, the problem that we have is that we look at transformation, we look at organizational development through myopic lenses. We complain that HR is fragmented and we complain that HR is siloed, but the practice of change management, the practice of organizational development in itself is siloed and fragmented. Because we, we evolve service delivery, which is IT, or we evolve policy, or we evolve process, or we evolve people, and then somehow we still fail. Well, that's because you can't do one without the other. You can't fix technology without fixing process. You can't require a process without understanding policy. And you can't do any of this without having an effective workforce to deliver it. So when you take organizational development theory and you simplify it in its most layman terms, there are four operational dimensions that have to be um, understood and considered in its entirety for every transformational effort, which is how we're going to use the BRM. From our people perspective, are we effectively resourced from a personnel perspective to do HR? From a policy perspective, what does the HR policy landscape at the federal and agency level look like in order to enable HR? What are agency level processes? Are they efficient? Are they effective? Are they archaic? That's okay to say. But are, do they need to evolve in order to support policy and enable IT? Because people deliver. Policy requires, 
process informs, IT enables. And then we have service delivery. So now we have service delivery, and I purposely left out the word HRIT because the business has gotten into the habit of building black boxes. I can't stress this enough. The government is phenomenal. Their core competency is politics, policy, bureaucracy, and citizen services. Why are they in the IT game? Why are they managing black boxes? And that's what I propose to the federal government at large, at least from an HR perspective. HR is a supporting function. If you look at um, um, the, uh, um, Porter's value chain theory, there are supporting functions and primary functions. Primary functions builds the iPhone, Supporting functions enables the build of the iPhone indirectly. HR is a supporting function. Why can't we do HR universally the same way, or at least expect the same outcomes at a minimum? And that's because we're too focused on building black boxes and blinky lights, and we're not focused on the output of those said services. So what we're shooting for here is People, policy, process, and technology, um, and service delivery is a single lens, not separate lenses that have to be considered in federal human capital transformation and modernization. So the question I would pose to you is how are you enabling those dimensions? How are you planning for them? How are you operating them? How are you improving them? But that's not all, folks. The government has a very unique operational dimension called cost. Why? Because the government, every Chico, gets to start with a budget, and then they're told, figure out your priorities. So in this particular case, if you ask a Chico, what is your priority here? They're going to say, at first, everything, Mike. I got, I'm responsible for all of it. Dun, dun, dun. However, then they get, well, you have $3 million to do everything. They're like, oh, well, well, in that case, Mike, you know, it's getting a little tricky now. Based on $3 million, now I can justify box number one, three, five, and seven in your menu, in your BRM menu. Like, okay, great. So that's why I centered cost as an operational a dimension that informs and overlays all other or the other four. Because you can't consider the transformation of people without understanding your formulation and your uh, and your actual is uh, and your um, and your actual budgets. What you ask for versus what you get. And the problem is if we look at all of these four dimensions in the singular then we can't assume that if you get $3 million for modernization, $3 million goes into this bucket. Because then you can't do anything everywhere else. You can't effectively staff. You can't effectively enforce. And you can't effectively understand how in order to enable the what. Any questions so far on human capital operational dimensions? So how do you use the BRM? It's very simple. Leaders and partners understand your budget and cost. Based on that, you select boxes. And once you select the box off of this menu, then you look at all these four operational dimensions for each one of these little boxes. Any questions so far? All right. So this next slide, I'm not going to talk through. Um, in one, of the, one of the handouts that was sent out, um, there's, a, there's a particular handout that says um, um, of how, how we can use the BRM. Um, the handout has, uh, gives you a lot of different examples. Uh, 
how, how we can use it to evolve and modernize people, policy, process, service delivery, HRIT, cost, data, categorization, reporting, human capital, business framework. And we're going to, the next part of the presentation is all about the human capital business framework, which we're going to talk about. However, in that handout, we also talk about um, how a practitioner can leverage the BRM. We talk about how specialist vendors can use the BRM and partners. We talk about how government leaders and HR leaders can use the BRM. So we give you examples. I'm not going to go through those now unless anyone specifically wants me to. Anyone want me to? All right. So what's next? So we spent a little bit of time creating the BRM. Now we need to operationalize the BRM. And we're operationalizing you, um, through, three, uh, through three different work streams. We are developing federal standards for service. And what does that mean, Mike? Well, historically, if you went to OPM's website and you went to the HRLOB requirements for the BRM, you can download hundreds upon hundreds of requirements, most of them being IT requirements. However, we don't care about how and we don't care about IT because if we're going to push and encourage the government to get out of the infrastructure game, the platform game, and the software game, and go straight into the service game, why do they need to understand whether you're using Oracle or not? So what we're basically saying, in summary, the, federal, um, the, the Human Capital Federal Integrated Business Framework, FIBF, is going to bring you a completely different perspective on defining requirements and standards. We've, it, it's a complete paradigm shift. When we come to acquisition, when we come to partners, when we come to service providers, we're no longer going to give you hundreds and thousands of requirements. We're basically going to say three things. One, well, one, there, the only thing we care about from a technology perspective is data standardization. Are you using the government's data standards? Two, again from a technology perspective, are you FedRAM certified? Or will you be FedRAM certified? Those are the only two IT questions that we should be asking. The third thing that we're bringing to the table is we're going to come to our agencies and we're going to come to our providers and we're going to come to our partners in industry with a baseline service catalog. We're going to tell you what services we want versus the other way around. Historically, um, well actually I'm, I'm going to pause there for a second. I'm going to finish this and then I'm going to go to the next slide which I'll talk a little bit about that. The next part of the operationalization is our codification synergy or alignment. Working with GSA and OPM um, and, and uh, OMB to begin adopting the BRM as a codif codification structure for acquisition operations and spend. And then what hasn't been developed yet, um, I'm currently working on developing, is a certification process for anyone that wants to deliver in this space. So HR and the LOB myth, there is an approved list of providers that are HR LOB certified. That is a myth. I busted it. I feel, I feel, I feel like a myth buster now. There's no such myth. There's no such thing. However, they, there will be. And what we're basically saying is, in the future, we're going to develop a certification process to help agencies, customer agencies, validate and prove that their providers, be it a federal provider or a partner provider, a vendor provider, is delivering the services we require at a minimum. In order to enable the, the common user experience, it has to be a universal application. So what that basically means, in the future when we say provider, we mean three things. We mean our, fer our federal 
shared service providers, which everyone is probably familiar with, our partnering industry providers, non-federal, and then my third favorite category, which all the agencies hate me for, they actually don't hate me. We high five, they're my peoples. Self-servicing agencies. In order to drive a common user experience across the entire federal government, everyone has to be held to the same standard. And more importantly, we have to start asking the question, if you're not able to meet that standard as a self-servicing agency, how much would it cost you to get there versus, versus the value proposition of moving to a provider? Hence the shared services model. So we're not saying no, we're just saying let the, let the cost-benefit analysis and the value proposition determine whether it is financially feasible for you to continue to self-service. Any questions so far? So something that I coined as the service delivery paradox. What is that? It's very simple. If I as customer tell you what I want and you as provider give me what I ask for, why am I customer still unhappy? It's very simple. As customer, I see all of these great product lines, both on the federal side and on the private sector side, of things that I want. They're known, they're winning awards, everything is great. And then we say, we want X, we want Y, because they're doing so good. And then when you come to the table, we give you a list of 500 requirements that takes that best in breed award winning um, product line and bastardizes it into some non-recognizable black box that's unique to some organization because. Well, why because? No one really knows why because, just because, right? So the way we're implementing the BRM, or the next phase of the BRM, the FIBF, the, the Human Capital Federal Integrated Business Framework, its purpose is to address this one challenge, this one paradox. And the answer is simple. The reason why we fail is because the perception of failure is worse than failure itself. Change Management 101. Just because you met the mark doesn't mean you succeeded if culture says you didn't. Culture eats success for breakfast every day. That being said, the answer to that is definition of service and common expectations. And that's our goal with our standardization, is developing a definition of service and an expected standard of delivery. Any questions so far? So this is our problem statement. Now we have the standard, the Human Capital Integrated Business Framework, or the federal FIBF. Now when we say the standard, or FIBF, we basically mean everything on the board. So it's not one thing, it's actually a suite of different things. So the first thing we deliver is a 10,000 foot view of a functional life cycle. What is the four, five, or six functional steps in the process of employee performance management? Every agency should be rallying around those common five or six processes um, at, a, at a 10,000 foot view, and then they can further dissect at its lowest level. Then we have what I, uh, what, what I call the Human Capital Management Service Catalog. We will build and we will give you a service catalog as a target. We will tell you what services we need per subfunction. In other words, if you're looking at the BRM, level one is not service. Level two, which are our subfunctions, is not service. There is a level three. Every one of these core subfunctions will have one or more services that will be defined as part of the service catalog. And, I'm and the last part of the slide is an example of how that works. 
So in our service catalog, we will define service, we will define service outcomes at a minimum. Then we will define service requirements. There are not IT requirements. It's very simple. What is required by the business to deliver that service? Not what is the blinky box and the platform you have to use. So, and I'm going to give you an, an, uh, um, an example of what that looks like. Then you have performance metrics. How are we, go, at a minimum, how are we going to measure success across the board? And the reality here is that every service today is at a different maturity state. Some services are very mature, we're doing it very well, and other services are not very mature. So the performance metrics will, will vary from qualitative to quantitative depending on the maturity level of said service. And they will evolve every year as the service becomes more mature and as there is a new baseline or target, the service metric itself will evolve. Then we have our use cases. And the use cases are probably one of the most important aspects of the initial procurement or acquisition process because it's very simple. Part of our service delivery paradox is the upsell. Anyone here ever walk into the store to buy a radio, um, or back in the 90s, to buy a radio and then get upsold to the fancy um, digital receiver, right? They got me every time. I was a fool for that. However, it is the upsell. And what is the federal upsell? Very simple. I will tell you I have something today with an understanding that I will build it effectively tomorrow. You just don't need to know about it, right? You just need to know this is my service offering. Forget the fact that it, it isn't complete yet. So this is what's going to happen. When we go out to market and we say these are the services we want, we are going to expect one thing at the very beginning. Very few um, partners, if any at all, will be able to say, I can deliver all of it. Why? Very simple. For the first time ever, we are not asking you what your services are that you can give us. We are telling you what we need. And not in the form of 10,000 requirements. So if you say, I can deliver service X, we will give you a use case for that service. And we will say, show it. There are eight steps here. Push a button or execute a process and show us how it starts at step number one and show us how it ends at step number eight. And the outcome is what it says it's supposed to be. If you can't, if you can't show me the money, everyone know what that term, that, that quote is from? Um, if you can't prove, if you can't, if you can't actually process, then you, don't, you can't actually deliver the service. So if you say you can, you have to prove you can. And that's the goal with the use case. The use case is not an end-all, be-all. It's not designed to test 100% of the service, but it's designed to test the majority of the service capability. That being said, there is usually a one-to-one -one mapping, one service to one, uh, one use case to one service. However, some services may have multiple use cases, depending on the complexity of the service. And then we have our employee digital record. We are in the process of designing and building a, a, the federal employee digital record, which will be the successor to EOPF and EHRI. It is going to be a complete machine readable, real digital employee record. One record for one employee throughout the life and career of that employee. We're looking at technologies like blockchain, data link, crypto encryption and algorithms. We're looking at ways that partnering agencies um,